gentlemen, please welcome back Judge Robinson. Of them 
are in the AI space, so he really knows what he's talking about. Please help me in putting your hands together, giving a very warm Beijing MQ welcome to Dr. Kai-Fu Lee, everybody. Thank you very much. So I've been working on AI for actually 39 years, to be exact, when I was uh, just two years old. No, I was uh, 17 in college, and it was the most exciting thing I could imagine. Uh, but even back then, I could not envision and visualize how much AI is beginning to change the world and how quickly it has done so. So in this talk today, I will talk to you about what is AI, what it can do, uh, what it means for mobility and transportation, and lastly, what are some of the challenges and problems that AI may bring to the world. So the best way to visualize what AI can do is let's see some demos. So I'm going to show you demonstrations of what AI can do today, and all of these demos are real, live, actual products. These are not research lab demonstrations, and most of them are from companies that we invested in. So here we go. <clears throat>
So, impressed? Good? <laughs> One of the first misconceptions about AI is that it's science, it's science fiction and very, very far away. Hopefully those demonstrations show you that it's operational today. And backing up a little bit, all the demos we've seen fit in the category of what's called narrow AI. What narrow AI means is that for one domain, we collect a lot of data, and that data is used to do one task. And as we saw in the cases of autonomous stores, uh, autonomous restaurants, autonomous vehicles, uh, and using AI to do finance and internet, those are single tasks optimized with massive amounts of data, and that's narrow AI. And narrow AI is blossoming and creating lots of applications. However, many of us who uh, grew up watching science fiction are thinking of general AI. That's AI that is in every way equal or better than human capabilities. And today, we are nowhere near delivering general AI or, or, um, or AI that's equivalent to human. Uh, that's still very far away. So the rest of my talk, I'll focus on narrow AI. So we've seen that in addition to the demos we've, we, that I've shown, AI is now beating people at many, many tasks in games, in uh, medical uh, recognition of lung cancer, skin cancer, um, neurological diseases, and in even taking standardized exams like SAT and GRE, uh, it's beating people and beating human champions. And this is coming out everywhere. And this is about uh, narrow AI really maturing to become a tool that could be applied to many specific domains. Among all technologies in narrow AI, the single biggest breakthrough is what's known as deep learning. The three inventors of deep learning won the Turing Award, that is the Nobel Prize in Computer Science. And the way deep learning works is that you create a neural network that is, um, that is basically inspired by the structure of the human brain, <clears throat> but it's billions of numbers trained on massive amounts of data with a specific outcome. So you're teaching this network how to separate people who uh, click on this merchandise and people who don't. People who buy this product, if you're Amazon, and people who don't. People who repay the loan or people who default, if you're a bank. So it's learning to discriminate different types of things. And what actually happens if you train this network based on a human faces, what you'll see is raw data coming in, uh, and then the output would be, this is John Doe, this is Mark Smith, and then the neural network will continue to learn whatever features that distinguishes the faces that you have. And actually, on the top, you see that these are automatically learned features, some of which are detecting the distance between our eyes and the shape of our faces and so on. And these are not with any human supervision. <coughs> Many of us may think that AI is best taught with human telling the machine how to do something, but that has been proven to not work. The way that deep learning or AI works is you want to minimally tell it knowledge. You just present a lot of data with a grand truth, and it learns from the truth directly. The advantage is that it's incredibly adaptable to new domains. The problem, of course, is you need many, many more, more data. You know, people learn to recognize faces on uh, maybe a few thousand examples, but the face recognition or speech recognition will need millions, and actually they get better even with billions of pieces of data, so it requires a lot of data. And if you have a domain that has a lot of data and a grand truth, then you're in business. This will beat human performance. So an example to illustrate, if we collected a lot of data on something, in this case, um, speeches by President Trump, and then it can learn to talk like President Trump. It's a great thing to build a better world with artificial intelligence. Synthesize and listen to the next. <laughs> this is from a Chinese company, iFlight. And actually, when you have a huge amount of data, you can not only learn to recognize and classify and uh, predict, you can learn to synthesize. So the capabilities are very, very strong. 
And in my book, AI Superpowers, and also you saw in the video, we divide the AI into four sections. So given what I've described, that AI works by taking a huge amount of data, connecting it to a grand truth outcome. So what domains can you do that? The easiest domain clearly is internet. Uh, Google, Facebook, Alibaba, Tencent, ByteDance, they have billions of pieces of data, and those data are connected to an outcome. So you can imagine, Amazon will show you a personalized page on which you're likely to maximize. It can map, show you a page for which that you will maximize your purchase. So imagine how happy Jeff Bezos is. He's got this machine that decides what page to show each of us. We all get different pages. And when that page is shown to us, um, it is proven that we are most likely to buy the most uh, merchandise is from Amazon when it's shown to us. And when Facebook shows us a page, uh, it wants to maximize the chance we will click and read something from our news feed. And of course, these capabilities also bring challenges, but that's another, another story. So uh, imagine you're a CEO, and now you have an ability to pick some domain, to collect a lot of data, and then connect it to a business outcome most clicks, most revenue, most profits. If you're a bank, minimal default. Uh, if you're an investor, maximize your profits. If you're an insurance company, decide whether to give insurance to people based on how likely they are to uh, have to file for claims. So it connects data directly to a business outcome. And that's why it's so amazing at the first wave, where internet has a huge amount of data, and every internet website or app has a specific single domain. So when you think about, is my domain suitable for AI? Ask the question, can I collect a lot of data? And do this data naturally lead to a grand truth kind of a business outcome? So naturally, beyond the internet AI, we have AI applications in financial industry. That's another area where transactions lead to direct business outcome, improved revenue or profits. Beyond the financial industry, there's education, government, supply chain, logistics, back office uh, are some of the second wave. And these four waves are overlapping, so they're happening all at the same time. Um, and wave one and wave two are dealing more with data that's already in your repository. A bank has all the transactions, and an internet website collects all user statistics. So you just apply AI to the data you have uh, already in, in, your, in your company storage. The third wave is beginning to push the frontier into data that we don't yet have. You know, we're generating a lot of data right here. Uh, cameras capturing all of us, microphones hearing us. Can these things be transmitted to, to turn into something useful for AI? That is, can we create the eyes and ears for the AI? Uh, we saw examples of speech recognition, uh, face recognition, computer vision, those are really just the beginnings. Um, we are just in the beginning of seeing AI recognizing um, objects and speech at higher than average human capability. And this is improving year over year because one of the magical things about AI is if you pile on more data, it becomes more accurate. So if you, if you plot the curve of, say, speech recognition accuracy, it's been constantly improving, dramatically improved by, by the advent of deep learning, and further improved every year with more data. So it's only a matter of time that uh, the translation service that you're hearing now, your ear, ear set, will be replaced by artificial intelligence. It may take 10 years, it may take 15, but that day will come. Um, and in addition to constantly improving recognition through the hearing and vision, uh, AI can also be added to sensor, sensor input. So if you have autonomous vehicle, the LiDAR uh, will be an additional element that can provide input. Also, we all know there are all kinds of um, sensors. Uh, even on your iPhones or Android phones, there is a depth sensing um, uh, sensor. If you, if you try to unlock your iPhone when the room is dark, it still does that. How does it do that when it can hardly see your face? It didn't turn on the flashlight or anything because it's actually projecting tiny little dots to your face and measuring the distance of each point on your face
to the iPhone. And so, so it's reconstructing your face in the dark. So that kind of capability, people do not have. So the ability to reconstruct three-dimensional objects in the dark, and the ability to sense humidity, uh, the ability to sense uh, heat, will make AI much more powerful than people, because we as humans cannot sense those things. You can imagine, if you can sense humidity and heat, you can predict uh, agricultural uh, throughput and things like that. So the third wave will add eye, eyes, ears, and many, many other sensors that will be superhuman capability. Then finally, the fourth wave is when AI adds our hands and feet. That is, it can move about and manipulate objects. It can start to become a um, blue collar worker on an assembly line. It can be a robot that brings things to you and does things for you. And of course, it can be autonomous vehicles and ever smarter drones. So the fourth wave is one um, that will dramatically change, change the world as AI um, advances itself to not only being an observer and recognizer, predictor, but also something that moves around very close to science fiction. So the fourth wave, I would say, is actually a little bit distant because the first three waves uh, are directly linked to deep learning. So the advance in deep learning, the collection of more data, is constantly exponentiating the capabilities in wave one, and two, and three. In wave four, you still have to deal with things like hand-eye coordination, dexterity, improvements in mechanical engineering. So wave four will take a little bit longer. But it is definitely within the next 15 to 20 years, these four waves will penetrate all the industries. You see under each wave, the industries I'm predicting that this will disrupt. And they essentially add up to 95% of our GDP. So there's no doubt that in the next 15 to 20 years, AI will be everywhere. Now back to the subject of mobility, uh, the subject of this conference. One of the big problems we see is that in many of the urban areas, the traffic congestion is a huge problem. We, we see that in Beijing, we see that in New York. Um, we spend a lot of time and waste a lot of time on the road. This is exacerbated by the fact that uh, a lot of the world is moving to urban um, environments and more people going into large cities will exacerbate the problem and create even more traffic and more energy issues and more environmental issues that uh, will challenge us. Uh, and if we look at today, uh, a car is actually parked 96% of the time, not terribly well utilized, and it's only actually delivering its purpose to us as car owners 3% of the time when we're driving. 0.5% looking for parking, and 0.5% stuck in traffic. So, so the car as a great product that's changed humanity is not very efficient in its use. So what technologies can be used to, to bring about changes? Um, I think the three big changes that will come about in the next 20 years are uh, ride sharing, Uber DD, uh, electrical vehicles, that is much greener energy, and um, <clears throat> uh, that we have to deal with battery issues and make sure that um, uh, it is continues to be green and sufficiently charged for our use. Um, both of these are mature technologies, getting better. And then thirdly, uh, autonomous driving. And autonomous driving is the big next breakthrough. And I'll talk more about autonomous driving uh, going forward. When these three things start to work together, really magic starts to happen. Um, we can envision that in the future, uh, all the data that's gathered by each driver uh, will be collected centrally that can help city planning. We can envision that mobility starts to be more of a service. It's not just a matter of getting a shared vehicle or a DD to come to you. Um, there will be one day when uh, my calendar will be very specific of where I want to be. And I will be able to speak to an agent, uh, an AI agent that says, plan my trip to New York and it will figure out as a mobility, as a service, uh, what airplane ticket, what car ride, where I need to be at which time, and uh, whenever I need a car, just in time, the kind of car I like, the level of price I'm willing to pay, will bring a car to me to 
just bring me to the place I need to go. And that car will be electrical, the car will be autonomous, and think about other implications when that day starts to happen. The car no longer needs to be shaped the way it is today. If the car is only taking one person, the car only needs to be large enough for one person. So further sa saving uh, a cost in building the car. And not only is the car cheaper, it's smaller, consumes less energy, the roads could be different. Why should the roads provide space for a truck when it can have some legs that are very small? As cars start to become autonomous, that is truly fully autonomous at L5 level of capability. Uh, L is a level of how autonomous vehicles are. Uh, L1 is basically simply assisting us while we humans are fully in charge of driving. Uh, L2 and L3, they start to do some functions, such as parking uh, for us. Then L4 is the machine can largely drive by itself, but the human still needs to be alert and jump in. L5 is when the steering wheel, the brake, and the accelerator are removed, and the car is just for the passenger. Okay? So when L5 happens, I've talked about how it will just in time take you to the place you need to go, but further than that, the car will become a part of your entertainment and workspace. You'll be in the car uh, watching movies, uh, conferencing with friends. You don't have to be driving anymore, nor does there have to be a dri driver for you. So the total amount of human time that will be saved is on the order of 9% of total human time on Earth. Because every time we travel on the bus, on the truck, on, on the train, in a car, um, the driver will be gone, whether it's us or the driver. So that's a huge savings uh, to humanity. It will also have tremendous capability because once more and more cars are autonomous, they will be able to talk to each other. So imagine, this car is not just driving like a human, um, but cars can talk to each other to minimize danger. Uh, so one car can tell other cars around it, I just blew a tire, be careful. Okay? And also, uh, if I'm in a hurry to get to work, I can tell my car to send a message to all nearby cars, get out of my way, I'll give you 10, ten cents. Okay? So those kind of capabilities start to happen to bring further more and more safety. And this kind of autonomous mobility as a service will further bring about uh, tr tremendous uh, savings for all of us, not just in money, energy, environment, but also saving lives. Because just like all AI, the more data we gather, the more capable the autonomous vehicle. So when the autonomous vehicle, let's say an L5 level, is finally launched, let's say in 15 years or 10 years, in the beginning, uh, we really have to be very conscientious when we build autonomous vehicle. When we launch, we have to make sure it's better than people. So maybe 1.3 million goes down to 1 million in the year of the launch. But in three years, the one million could go down to half a million. In 10 years, it could go down to 10,000. And eventually, almost no people will die from human uh, accident because the cars are watching and learning by aggregating the data. This is not science fiction. Uh, one of the coolest features launched was Tesla's summoning feature. Um, it's an RV conference, maybe I shouldn't be mentioning another brand. <laughs> but the feature is very cool. What it is is, uh, when you take a car, go shopping, and then you want to, you forget where your car is parked. So you're at the edge of the shopping mall, and you summon your car, and your car will drive by itself and come to you. It's a very clever application because it doesn't require going on highways. It's from a parking lot to the side of a mall. It's very convenient. But the interesting thing was, when that product was launched, it wasn't very good. People were posting videos on YouTube saying, oh, this is how silly, this is how dumb, it's very slow. But then, within a few days, uh, a million people used the feature, and the data was used to retrain the AI, and it got a lot better. So that should point the way to the future that we can anticipate in the future. As we gather more data, the casualties will go down every year as the cars drive by itself. So here are some examples of investments that we made um, at uh, Sanovation. This is a company called Momenta. Uh, you can see this is a fully autonomous driving with a safety driver. It's um, able to go off, uh, off the highway ramp by itself, 
converge with traffic, knows how to yield as cars are coming from the right side. So basically at human level capabilities. Second example is um, from another portfolio company called um, WeRide. This company is now offering taxi service for, uh, for right now not for everybody, but if, if someone, a VIP goes to Guangzhou, there's an app you can use that will bring the autonomous car to you, driven by itself, and take you to 100 hotels. It doesn't go to any place, but you can imagine going from the airport to 100 top hotels, that's fixed route, so it's quite doable. Uh, there's still a safety driver uh, in, the, in, the, in the driver's seat at this time. A third example we saw earlier is uh, in the Daxing Airport. So this is a shuttle for between terminals and from parking lot going to, uh, going to the, uh, the airport. It's already fully operational, and in this case, because it's not out on the highway, it's able to be fully autonomous. As you can see, there's not even a steering wheel in this autonomous vehicle product. Very convenient, and it's at a lower speed, so you don't have to worry too much about uh, human casualty. And then the fourth example of uh, Feibu is now already delivering packages on trucks that are autonomously driven, uh, primarily on highways. Highway driving, as it turns out, is much easier for autonomous vehicle. Today's technology already drives better autonomously on highways compared to humans. Of course, there are issues to deal with on highways because these are big trucks. If there is ever um, uh, an accident, it could be quite dangerous, so we have to be cautious about deploying it. Uh, but we can imagine highway would be one of the first places in which autonomous vehicle uh, would be launched. Uh, so with the increasing, uh, increasing traffic congestion, we envision there are many places that the three combinations, ride-sharing, autonomous vehicle, and electrical vehicles can be combined. So we envision that uh, in the future, with the things I talked about, we will see uh, time savings, values, improvements, greater safety, better ecology, better coverage, and better capacity with these three changes. It's very exciting to be living in this time because this will be uh, as big a change, if not bigger, compared to when uh, automobiles were invented and replaced uh, horses. And we can imagine autonomous vehicle in the future can be deployed in this kind of a modular situation that if we don't think of each car as replacing its current manual driving with autonomous driving, but rather have these modules. The modules would have people and will be instructed to uh, uh, take the exit. These uh, cars are connected together and essentially they're, drive they're being driven in a rail Rail road without the rails, so it's extremely safe. They're fully connected, um, and, uh, and and they follow each other, and they can dock, and and this can be a, 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 an idea that can make things better. So I've already talked about L5. How far away is L5? That is a car without any human um, intervention purchase. So the left one show the left one shows the. Uh, like an aut autonomous cruise control, basically takes over driving when you're on the highway. That's already happening. The middle one shows the fixed run. That can be done. It just cannot deal with extreme long tail examples. And then on the right, it shows some autonomous trucks for the highway. So that will come probably in the next three to four years. Uh, and certainly that brings up a, a huge money saving because today, uh, you need two truck drivers if you want a 24 by 7 um, truck to delivery. Uh, otherwise, the truck, the truck driver has to sleep. But with autonomous uh, trucks, you can have fresh goods much faster without any human involvement. Of course, it will bring up issues such as will truck drivers lose their jobs? And we'll talk a little bit about that later. One interesting aspect of L5 is the premise of L5 taking 20 years, as hypothesized by Google, is maybe only true when we think about, when we assume that the cities cannot be changed. So if the cities are what they are, and cars are what they are, plus L5, it might take 20 years or even 30. But let's ask the question, what if we can change the city? What if we rebuild the highways with sensors 
that will make it safer? What if we get rid of all the roads that are too hard for, um, for cars to drive? What if we create a two-layer downtown where the pedestrians and cars are forcibly by law separated so that cars cannot hit pedestrians anymore? These are very ambitious undertakings that most countries and most cities would not dare to think about. But here's where China comes into, into this game, is that China actually has projects uh, from Xiong'an as a city, uh, to smart city in Beijing, uh, to uh, uh, Zhejiang province uh, uh, highway uh, renovation. This process of very expensive infrastructural rebuilding is something that may bring about L5 by, ch by challenging the hypothesis that a city cannot be changed. Why can't we rebuild them? China has built Shenzhen from nothing, from a from basically a fisherman's uh, village to Shenzhen today in the past 30 years. Why can China or another country not build more cities like it? And once this is demonstrated with efficacy, more countries can follow suit. So this is an opportunity, we think, that can accelerate L5 without waiting the full 20 years. Here are some other concept demos of what uh, autonomous vehicles can bring about. Here is an example of a deep, lower down level where the car is autonomously driven in a in the cradle. So again, extremely safe. It's like driving in on a train or, or uh, in a tunnel with rails. So 100% safe solution that could be built as another form of infrastructure. And uh, another example, a concept demo by Uber shows that the future of um, uh, helicopters and drones, this is autonomously driven drone that can carry a human and it can uh, basically navigate the airspace. It turns out uh, flying is easier than driving because for driving, we're basically on a two-dimensional road and cars will have to run into each other. When you're flying, uh, you can avoid each other by flying a little bit higher or a little bit lower and, and, the, and planes can be very precise about their three-dimensional dimensional axis. And of course, we've seen the SpaceX 